about Jagannath because next week, as you know, we'll be having Jagannath Rasiyatra. And there's an old Back to Godhead magazine article from 1975. Who was born after 1975? Raise your hand. <laughs> so this is, this is an old one. But it's very nice because it puts together a lot of um, information found in various legends about Lord Jagannath and how, particularly how Lord Jagannath came into this world, as we all know. But you can see the picture here on, this, on the screen of Lord Jagannath. He has a very unusual appearance, and there must be a reason for that. No other deity of Krishna and Balaram and Subhadra that I know of, they look quite like that. So, um, let's hear about it. <coughs> uh, this is, uh, again, from... BTG volume 10, number 7, I guess. That's back in 1975, the appearance of Lord Jagannath. The Virathyathira festival, the parade of the chariots of Lord Jagannath Subhadra and Balaram, is yearly celebrated at the home of Lord Jagannath in India called Jagannath Puri. At Jagannath Puri, Lord Jagannath is worshipped in one of the oldest temples in India. <coughs> this Jagannath temple is actually mentioned in. Mahabharata and ancient sources like that. Even at the time of the Kurukshetra battle, Puri was already a sacred place even then, so it's going back back far. Uh, the story of how Jagannath appeared is a very interesting episode in Vedic history. King Indrajuna was a great devotee of Lord Vishnu and was very eager to meet him face to face. One time, by the Lord's arrangement, a devotee of the Lord arrived in the court of King Indrajuna, and in the course of discussion, he began to talk about an incarnation of Lord Vishnu named Nila Madhava. After hearing these topics, King Indrajuna became very inspired and sent different brahmanas in different directions to search for and inquire about Lord Nila Madhava. After um, all of them, however, were unsuccessful and returned to the capital city of the king except for one priest of the name Vidyapati. Vidyapati, I believe, was the brother of the chief priest of this particular king, Indrajumna. Now, King Indrajumna said was the king of Avantipura. Anybody know where is Avantipura? There's no such thing as Avantipura nowadays. We have a different name for it. No hints? Nowadays they call it a Jain. It's in Malva, Rajasthan. So he was king in that place, and I believe this was happening in the Treta Yuga, because he was interested in the Yuga Dharma of the next age, the following age. This is at the end of the Treta Yuga. So he was very interesting. It's like sometimes we also wonder what's going to happen when Kalki comes. <laughs> we might have this desire in our mind, I don't know, wonder what Kalki looks like. So he was very interested, he was very keen on seeing this Nila Madhava because there was going to be a new process in the next age. In the Treta Yuga, what were they doing? 
What was the what was the yoga term in that? Hmm? Sure. Vetayam yajato makai with butter. Yeah, they were offering sacrifice. But the next yuga dharma, the Dvapara yuga, which hadn't yet occurred, they were going to do deity worship, and he was thinking, "Oh, this really sounds interesting." So he wanted to see this preview, you might say, this uh, Lord uh, Nilamatra, and he sent out all these brahmins, and nobody could find it except his um, uh, brothers, um, his chief priest's brother. So that priest was named Vidapathy. So after wandering in many places, Vidapathy finally came to a district, and this is different from the famous Maithili poet, Vidapathy, obviously, he was in Kali Yuga. This is going back long, long before that. So after wandering in many places, Vidapathy finally came to a district whose population was a non-Aryan type called Shavaras. They were Adivasis, in other words, scheduled castes, you might say. So there he took shelter in the house of a local named, a local chief named Vishwavasu. When he arrived, the master of the house was not there, but his young daughter Lalita was there alone. In a short time, the master of the house returned and instructed his daughter to render all service needed for hospitality to the Brahmin guest. For some time, Vidyapati stayed there, and later, by the special request of the Shavara, he married the Shavara's young daughter, Lalita. While Vidyapati lived in the house of the Shavara, he noticed some peculiarity about his host's behavior. Every night, in the middle of the night, the Shavara would go out, and on the next day, around noon, he would return to the house, scented with various fragrances such as camphor, musk, and sandalwood. Vidyapati inquired from his wife about the reason for this, and she informed him that her father would go out to a secret place to worship Sri Nila Madhava. After that day, Vidyapati's joy knew no bounds. Actually, Lalita had been ordered by her father not to tell anyone about Sri Nila Madhava, but she overstepped that order, <clears throat> by telling her husband. Vidyapati immediately became eager to see Sri Nila Madhava. After all, this is the person he was, he was sent out to find. So, And finally, one day, by the repeated requests of his daughter, the Shavara Vishwavasu bound the eyes of Vidyapati and took him to see Sri Nila Madhava. Because, after all, he cannot refuse the daughter's request. And he's the son-in-law. So the Shavada Vishwavasu blindfolded Vidyapati and took him to see Sri Nilamadava. As they were leaving, Vidyapati's wife secretly bound some mustard seeds in the border of Vidyapati's cloth, so that while passing on the path, he threw them down to mark the way. <laughs> when they reached Sri Nilamadava, the Shavada removed the blindfold, and Vidyapati, seeing the unprecedented beauty of the deity of Sri Nilamadava, began to dance in ecstasy and offer prayers. Here it is clearly seen that Sri Nila Madhava was a deity incarnation of the Supreme Lord. Um, this deity incarnations are called Arjavigraha, or sometimes it's like the Sri Vaishnavas, what do they call them? Arjavatara. So, they're called incarnations. The deity is also another kind of incarnation. The Lord appears in deity forms to benefit his devotees, especially those who are less advanced. Since the Lord cannot be seen by any but the most advanced devotees, he appears as the deity to accept worship. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Man mana bhavamad bhakto madhyaji man namaskuru. How many times does Krishna say this? Twice. Twice. He says it in chapter 9, which is considered to be the essence of the Gita. And he says it again at the end, which is the summary of the Gita. So he really means it. Now, how are you going to become Madhyajni Man Namaskuru if you don't have someone to bow down to? You can't really bow down to the all-pervading uh, spiritual light because it's everywhere. So in order to follow Krishna's instruction in Bhagavad Gita, we have to bow down to someone. Therefore, the Lord incarnates as deity. Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, and offer your obeisances. Therefore, he appears as the deity to accept the worship and obeisances of his devotees. He puts himself in the hands of his devotees to receive their service and help them develop love for him. Because we, learn, we, we love someone by serving. My Tabla Guru is an American. 
and his name is David Courtney. You can see he's got a nice website. So once he wrote a very nice article about this. He was talking about arranged marriages. He also had an arranged marriage. And he said that love is actually unconditional. As soon as you say that you love someone because of this or because of that, what are you introducing into the picture? Condition. A condition. You're introducing what we call in Sanskrit a hetu, a reason. Love cannot have any reason. So arranged marriage, has. there's no reason for it, or at least there's no personal reason for it. <laughs> Sometimes there are political reasons for it, <laughs> uh, especially in Indian history, but... Um, and we'll see that maybe we don't know. We don't know why this Vidyapati married Lalita, but because <laughs> he found out only later on. So maybe he appears innocent. But <clears throat> anyway, love has to be causeless. It has to be unmotivated. They begin to love each other. It's natural. So in Krishna consciousness, the same thing is there, rather I should say, the same thing which is an eternal absolute truth is found even in its perverse reflection in this material world. This is the principle, by love we serve. So Krishna, out of love for us, and to help us develop love for him, he's appeared as the deity. So this is an aspect of Krishna's great mercy and his desire to free all the conditioned souls from bondage in this material world. Thus, the Dhyapati personally witnessed the mercy of Sri Nilamadava. After Vidyapati finished his prayers, the Shavarta kept him near the deity and went out to collect roots and forest flowers for worship. While the Shavarta was out, Vidyapati witnessed an astonishing thing. A crow fell off of a branch of a tree into a nearby lake and drowned. Immediately, that crow took a four-armed spiritual form and started back to the spiritual sky by Kunta. <laughs> Seeing this, the Brahmana thought, well, he climbed up to the top of the tree and was about to jump into the lake himself, following the liberated crow. But as he was about to jump, what happened? Anybody know? You hear the voice? At this point, there's always the Akashvani, right? <laughs> so the Akashvani, this voice in the sky said, O Brahmana, since you've been able to see Sri Nilamadava, you should, before all else, inform King Interjuna. Thus the Brahmana climbed down from the tree and waited. The Shavada soon returned, carrying forest flowers and roots, and started his daily worship of Lord Nila Madhava. Possible to open the window, maybe? Thank you. As he was engaged in the service of the Lord, the Lord spoke to him, saying, I have for so many days accepted the simple forest flowers and roots offered to me by you. Now I desire to accept the royal service offered to, be, to me by my devotee, King Indijumna. Wow, <laughs> that must have been a blow, can you imagine? This is something we, what can we learn from this? That there is other devotees. <laughs> We're not necessarily the only one, or the best one, although in our neophyte stage we always assume that. Uh, what, what's another story similar to this, anybody know? Where a devotee was uh, caring for a particular deity, and then the deity himself decided, I'm going with this one instead of you. Sri Rangam. Rangam. Huh? Rangam. Sri Rangam. And anything else? In Vrindavan? Sanatana Goswami. He went to Matra, and he found one Chaube couple. They were worshipping Madan Gopal, deity of Krishna, Madan Mohan. And they were worshipping the Lord in Vatsalya Rasa, so they were considering the Lord as one of their children. And the Lord would go and play in their courtyard along with the other children. And then when it was time for the Pogarpan, then he would come and sit on the altar and become Takurji. <laughs> so because of this intimacy and love was there, she was so informal in her worship that she would rise early in the morning. And you know, formerly people didn't have toothbrushes. That's an aspect of modern civilization. Uh, although it's not very sustainable because all those toothbrushes have to go back to the earth in the form of plastic. The more sustainable thing to do is what? Danta kashta, right? Some leaf, some some twig. People, Pra Prabhupada used to do this also. Eucalyptus, he liked eucalyptus because it was good for the teeth. Otherwise, normally people use neem. So this lit woman, after rising in the morning and brushing the teeth with a stick, she was so informal in her worship, she was using that stick to stir the kitchen if she's offering to Madan Gopal. <laughs> oh! <laughs> This is avidhi purvakam. Yajanti avidhi purvakam, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. 
you, you, this is against the rules. Because in deity worship, we have to be very clean um, and uh, punctual and clean, Prabhupada said. These are the best things. So, after some time, Sanatan Goswami came to visit, and he fell in love with this particular deity of Gopal. His mind was enchanted, and he was just thinking in his mind, if I can offer some seva. And at the same time, he saw how they're worshipping like this during the pot with the Dantakashta, and he was horrified. He said, I, wish, I don't know, how can this be? So, anyway, that's a long story. I don't want to go into it, but that's another example of... Uh, the bottom line is that the Lord decided of his own accord to go with Sanatana Goswami. And so similarly here, the Lord has apparently decided that he's going to go with Indijumna, but we'll see, because there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. It's not over until it's over. Let's see what happens now. Now, when the Sharada heard this, he thought, Oh my God, I'll be cheated out of the service of Sri Nila Madhava. When the deity is talking to him like this, he's thinking, this, I've been cheated. He was angry. Therefore, he was infuriated with his daughter, first in law for telling, for, for revealing the secret. And then what did he do with Vidyapati? He tied him up and <laughs> kept him prisoner in the house. And he said, you, you know, no bans, no bansuri, right? <laughs> if there's no Vidyapati to go and tell King Indrajumna, then Indrajumna is not going to come and get the deity. So I'm going to keep you here bound up. This was his intention. After some time, however, when he cooled off a little bit, uh, at the re and at the repeated request of his daughter, he freed the brahmana and allowed him to go. After all, this is really not the most healthy relationship to have with your son-in-law, keep him prisoner, tied up in your house. So the brahmana then immediately went to King Indrajumna and informed him of the discovery. The king, in great ecstasy, you can't imagine this, this king, he was sitting for years waiting, hadn't heard from anybody, probably assumed Vidyapati must have been killed. And then to get Vidyapati coming back and say, I found the deity. You can imagine how much ecstasy this king must have been in. So he went forth with many people to bring back Sri Nila Madhava. From the mustard seeds thrown along the path, and that's not close. This Nila Madhava, they say, was being worshipped in, what is that district uh, on the east side, Bolangir district of Orissa. Uh, way, way back in the middle of Orissa. And Avantipur is all the way on the other side of the subcontinent, Rajasthan. So it was quite a trek they undertook to get this deity. So when they got to the environs of this Nila Madhava deity, they found the mustard seeds that they had grown into plants by now. And so they, then with Vidyapati's memory, they were able to trace their steps back to where the king was keeping Nila Madhava, following those plants. So when they reached that spot, however, they found that the deity was gone. <clears throat> Not being able to see the beautiful form of the Lord, King Indrajumna besieged the village of the Shavaras and arrested the Shavara king, Vishwavasu. Suddenly, however, another voice in the sky said to the king, Akashvani always comes at the right time. Same thing happened when Kamsa was about to kill his daughter-in-law. Akashvani said, you fool. I don't understand. So this Akashwani says, Release this Shavara. On top of the Nila hill you should construct a temple. There, as Daru Brahma, or the absolute truth manifest in the wooden form, you will see me. And you will not see me again as Nila Madhava. What to do? We have our plans. Krishna has his plans. Sometimes it doesn't work the way that we want to. That's what proves that we're not the Supreme Personality of Godhead in case any of you have met people who want to convince you that you are. We're not. So sometimes you lose, really. You really do lose, sometimes. So he told him to release the Shavara, and instead construct a big palace on top of Nilachala, Nilakandara, and there I'm going to preside as Dharu Brahma, but not as Nilamadava. You're not going to see me again as Nilamadava. What to do? The king had to follow the Lord's command to build the temple at Indrajun Maharaj made arrangements to bring stone from a place called Balumala by building a road from there to the Nilakandara hill. What does that indicate? There was some hard work involved. He built a road from one place to another place just to, not even to start the temple, just to facilitate the temple construction. So he was working hard. 
Um, the holy abode of Sri Kshetra, or Puri, is in the shape of a conch. And in the navel of that conch, the king established a town of the name Rama Krishnapuram, the city of Rama and Krishna, and constructed the temple. This temple extended 60 cubits beneath the earth and rose 120 cubits above the surface. At the top of the temple, the king built a kalash, or a round pinnacle, and on top of that, a chakra, or a disc. He also had the temple decorated with golden ornamentation. Then, King Indrajumna, desiring for Lord Brahma to consecrate this temple, traveled to Brahmaloka and spent a long time there waiting for him. Now, what happens when you go to Brahmaloka and wait there for a long time? What happens to all your friends and relatives and your career and your bank balance and your car and all that stuff? <laughs> You have to understand, Aharya Brahmanovidu, in Bhagavad Gita, what Krishna says, a thousand ages, they constitute twelve hours of Brahma's one day, and the night is equal duration. Twenty-four hours of his day is some two thousand cycles of ages. Just to give you an idea here of the time span that we're talking about, this current age, Kali Yuga, lasts how many years? 432,000 years, and it's the shortest one of all. The others are, respectively, uh, consecutively, they're twice as long as that. So the Dvapara Yuga was 864,000 years, and before that was Treta Yuga, twice that amount, etc. So, and a thousand of those is only half of a day for Brahma. Brahma lives for a year, 365 such days, and he lives for a hundred years. <laughs> so, King Indraduna, um, during that time, the temple, which is very near to the seashore, became covered with, a, with sand from the shore. It was buried in sand dunes while he was waiting to, for Brahma. Brahma was maybe busy at the moment, couldn't immediately answer the door. <laughs> By the time he came, the whole temple and generations had gone and passed. What to do? <laughs> So, when King Indrajuna was away, first Suradeva and then Galamadava took over as kings of that area. It was Galamadava who raised the temple from within the sands, where it had been buried for a long, long time. So in other words, this king named Galamadava discovered, it's like we say we have a discovery, right? We make discoveries in science. There's nothing new, Prabhupada said, actually. There's nothing at all new. It's just that we discover things. Discover. So the temple was discovered, the sand was removed, and shortly after that, King Indrajuna returned from Lord Brahma's abode. Indrajuna claimed that he had constructed the temple, but Galamadava put forward his claim that it, he was its constructor. In a banyan tree near the temple, however, there lived a Bhushandi Kaka. Anybody heard of this character before? Bhushandi the crow? Famous crow, he's in Ramayana and other places. This crow is living for eons. He doesn't die. A little bit like Mark and Deirishi. He has a long, long, long life. And he just, he doesn't do anything except for chant the name of Ram. Ram! Ram! <laughs> That's what he does. So he sits on this Akshayavak, this banyan tree, and he's Ram! Ram! <laughs> so they thought that this person will be a good Sakshi. He'll be, make a good witness. So they took the matter to the crow, and the crow confirmed, yes, Indra actually built the temple. So, from his abode on the branches of the banyan tree, the crow had seen the whole construction of the temple. Therefore, he made it known that actually King Indrajuna had constructed the temple and that in his absence it had been covered by sand. He further said that King Galamadava had later merely uncovered the temple. Because King Galamadava had concealed the truth somewhat, Lord Brahma then ordered him to reside outside the grounds of the temple, on the western bank of the lake called Indrajuna. Indrajuna Sarovar. Indrajuna then prayed to Lord Brahma to consecrate the temple and the surrounding area. But, as Sri Kshetra, which gives the highest type of liberation, uh, is always manifest by this Lord's own internal potency, Lord Brahma said, It is not within my power to install the Lord here. Lord Jagannath and his abode are eternally situated in this mature world by his own mercy. Therefore, I shall simply place a flag on top of the temple and give the blessing that anyone who from a distance sees this flag and bows down, offering his prostrated obeisances, that person shall easily become liberated. Anyone here been to Jagannath Puri? 
<clears throat> so you've seen the chakra on top, and you'll be, you'll be easily liberated. Now, Rupa Goswami says in his Bhakti Rasamrit Sintu that the demigods see the resonance of this Purikshetra as being four-armed. Anyway, after some time, King Indraduna became discouraged at so much delay. You have to and consider all that he's already been through, and it's not over yet. He became a little bit discouraged at so much delay in seeing Sri Nilamada. Deciding that his life was useless, he lay down on a bed of kusha grass, determined to give up his life by fasting. Because in the Vedic literatures, there's only one way that you can, you can say, commit suicide, and that's by voluntarily fasting until death. And even then, it's very tightly regulated. Under certain, certain conditions, only you can do this. So he decided that he was going to do this. At that time, however, Lord Jagannath spoke to him in a dream as follows. My dear king, don't be anxious. I will come, floating in from the sea in my wooden form as Daru Brahma, at a place called Banki Mohan, which is near Puri. So, because after all, he had gone through so much struggle and so much time and built this huge temple and still the deity's not there. How discouraging that must be. So the Lord came in a dream and said, I will come. This Daru Brahman, I will come and nearby. So with a company of soldiers, the king then went to that place and saw on the shore a huge piece of wood marked with a conch, disc, club, and lotus. Although he engaged many men and elephants to move that Daru Brahma, or woody Brahman, they couldn't even budge it. But that night in a dream, Lord Jagannath again spoke to the king, saying, Bring my previous servant, Vishwavasu, who used to serve me as Nila Madhava, and place a golden chariot in front of the Daru Brahma. Then the king began to work according to the instruction of this dream. He brought the shower to Vishwavasu and put him on one side of Daru Brahma, and on the other side he put, put the Brahmana, Vidyapati. I always wondered how these two are still alive at this point. <laughs> I don't know. There's, usually there's some explanation for it. I've heard many different versions of this story, and they always include little details like this. So I'm sure there's an explanation available somewhere, but not in this particular account. <clears throat> so placing the golden chariot before the Daru Brahman, he then started kirtan, chanting the holy names of the Supreme Lord. Here we see, even though it's not Kali Yuga yet, they're still doing kirtan. Kirtan is one of the eternal nine processes of bhakti. Um, then the king caught hold of Daru Brahman and prayed for the Lord to mount the chariot. Daru Brahman was then easily placed on the chariot and taken to an appointed place. There, Lord Brahma began a sacrifice and established the deity of Lord Narasimhadev on the raised platform of that sacrifice. It is said that the place where the present temple stands is the place where the sacrifice was performed and that the Narasimha deity now standing at the western side of the Mukti Mandap within the temple compound, is that original Narasimha deity. Have you, you know where these places are? Mm. There's a place inside the temple called Mukti Mandap. That's where all the Pandits, they have their Shastra Arta Divad, right? Mm. They all discuss philosophical matters there. And on the west of that, there's a Narasimha Dev temple. Uh, it's described that Chaitanya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he used to visit the uh, temple of Jagannath, he would go up the steps and he would offer his obeisance to the Lord. Another single day there also. So it's said that this is the very same deity that was installed by King Indrajumna. Now, to carve the deity of Lord Jagannath from this Daru Brahman, King Indrajumna called many expert sculptors. None of them, however, was able to touch Daru Brahman, for as soon as they started and tried to carve, their chisels broke and fell to pieces. Another frustration. To, you see? Devotional service, if you're having a hard time, <laughs> it's not just you. <laughs> it's hard for everybody. And the reason it's hard is that Krishna likes to make it a little tough. Because if it's not a little hard for us, then we take it very easily. And as soon as we take Krishna for granted, antartan hogya. He'll, he'll disappear. So, Finally, the Supreme Lord himself came in the disguise of an old artist who introduced himself as Ananta Maharana. Now, I don't know, but this, generally the kings in Rajasthan, where Indigena Raj is from, they go by the title Maharana. So if there's some connection there, I, I don't know. But this old, old man came 
and he introduced himself as such. Um, however, the Narad Purana has a different account. It says this was actually Vishvakarma, the architect of the demigods, not the Supreme Lord himself. But whoever it was, it was he was in the guise of an old man. And he came and offered to carve the deities in pursuance of the desire of Lord Vishnu, who, um, who had come as Dharagrama. He promised that if he were allowed to work behind closed doors for 21 days, the deity would be carved. So immediately preparations were made. According to the old sculptor's directions, all of the artists were engaged in making the chariots only. The old sculptor alone then took the Dhabha Brahman into the temple and closed the doors. After making the king promise that the sculptor would reside alone and that the king would not open those doors, slightly even, before the 21 days were up. So that was the condition. You don't open these doors for 21 days, three weeks, and you'll have your deal. I move from one place to another. You are a of Bengal. Don't know. <laughs> and Abhasan Prasadanta Sahaja Balabhadrena Badena, along with his brother Baladam, he lives in this great palace on top of the Nilachala hill on the shore of that ocean. Therefore, the place where they live is called Rama Krishnapuram. Balaram and Krishna live there. And Subhadra Madhyasta Sakalasura Seva Basarado. Subhadra is in between them, and they all give the opportunity for Seva to the devotees. It's like now. Lord Jagannath, after the Snan Yatra, traditionally every year, he catches a cold, transcendental cold. And so they sequester him upstairs and taking care of him, giving him fruit juice and kitchari and things that you give for sick people. And they're taking care of him. They're, they're giving an opportunity for seva. Then next week, once Lord Jagannath resumes, once he's all, and plus they're painting him at the same time and making his transcendental features ever fresh <laughs> to protect the words of the Vedas. And next week he's going to go to Venice Beach, <laughs> Santa Monica. Instead of Baradanda and Puri, he's going to Santa Monica, blessing the residents of Southern California. He will, as he's proceeding down the Baradanda at the boardwalk, our boardwalk, our Baradanda is called boardwalk. In Jagannath Puri, the main grand route, they call it, is called Baradanda, where the Rath carts proceed for Rath Yatra. So here we call it boardwalk. So as he's proceeding down there, um, Bhudeva Partalai, groups of Bhudevas. Who are the Bhudevas? Gods on the earth? Brahmanas. Groups of Brahmanas. They're offering prayers at every step. At every step they're offering prayers. And Lord Jagannath is pleased to hear those prayers. Along with the goddess of fortune, he's giving its mercy to the whole world. Even Southern California is not being neglected. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada said, he's not Purinath, he's not just Oriyanath, he's Jagannath. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada gave Jagannath to the whole world, and particularly this Ratiyatra. So, hearing the words of Lord Jagannath in his dream, the king became satisfied and prayed to him as follows, My Lord, grant those who appear in the family of the sculptor who manifested your form that, may, that they may age after age assist in constructing the three carts. Lord Jagannath smilingly uh, replied, Tathastu. Tathastu means, may it be so. <clears throat> Generally, when, you offer, when the Lord offers boons, the devotees always ask for three boons, right? Like when you have a genie coming out of the bottle, there's also all the kind of three wishes. So, that was his first wish. Then Lord Jagannath said to the king, The descendants of Vishwavasu, who used to serve me as Nila Madhava, should generation after generation serve me. They may be called my Dayatas. Those devotees who are taking care of Jagannath after Snan Yatra, before the Puri Ratha Yatra, they are called Dayatas. Dayata means somebody who's been blessed by the Lord, who's received the Lord's Daya. Remember, as we said, Daya Sinjur Bantu, Dhyadi. So, <coughs> they're the descendants of these um, Vishwavasu, Vishavaras. 
they're not necessarily Brahmins, even, born as Brahmins, but they've been elevated because of their respectable position in devotional service, which just goes to show that devotional service is, in fact, the basis of aristocracy, not just birth. So, the descendants of Vidyata, Vidyapati, born of his Brahmin wife, should perform my deity worship ordinarily, every day, daily worship. He had two wives. He was married before, and then he married Balita later. So his Brahmin wife, their descendants, performed the Nitya Puja for Lord Jagannath. And then the descendants born from his Shavari wife, Lalita, they should cook my food. And they will be called Suaras. So then King Indra said to Lord Jagannath, My Lord, kindly grant one favor to me. Let the doors of your temple be closed for only three hours a day. The rest of the time let the doors be open so that the residents of the universe may have access to see you. Further, let it be that all day long your eating may go on and that your lotus fingers may never become dry. <laughs> That's why 56 offerings. His fingers are always wet because he's constantly eating. <laughs> Not an eating disorder. <laughs> it's ecstasy. This is love. Ah. When they take out Jagannath in Jagannath Puri, when they're doing the rath, um, they bring all the bog there? Yeah, the yeah, they do. At a certain point, and if you've gone to Ratyaja, the cart either he stops of his own accord, or they stop at certain intervals if he doesn't, and they bring out some bog and they offer him. And he eats. And even those persons who are qualified, they come out from their houses and they put something on the cart and the Lord will eat. Yes. He'll eat. Two deities are eaters. One is Giridaj Govardhan, the other one is Jagannath. Sometimes you, you don't want to put them together for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise they fight. <laughs> I went to I went to Nandagaon in Vrindavan. The top of the hill there is the temple of Krishna and Balaram. So they all dress the deities exactly alike. In fact, that both the deities are black. Both of them, it looks like two Krishnas, one standing next to the other. Everything exactly the same. Same flute, same crown, same peacock, same <laughs> necklaces, everything precisely the same. No, you can't tell them apart at all. So I asked the Pujari, they, well, how come they both look like Krishna? They did the same thing, everything. And he said, that's because if you... If you have anything different, then they'll fight over inside of <laughs> <laughs> So then Lord Jagannath replied, Tathastu, so be it. And for yourself, what benediction do you ask? Lord Jagannath is asking the king. So the king replied, so that no one in the future will claim your temple as his own property, I desire to be without descendants. Kindly grant me this one benediction. And Lord Jagannath replied, Tathastu. So be it. Thus, the merciful Lord Jagannath and Patran Balaram appeared in this material world to benefit all living beings. What is the benefit they bestow? That's stated in the Nadar Purana. Pratimam tatartam drishtva svayam devi nirmitam anaya sena vayyanti bhavanam me tatornaraha. The Supreme Lord Narayana tells Lakshmi Devi, in that great abode as, known as Purushottam Kshetra, which is rarely achieved among all the three worlds, the cage of a deity who is fashioned by the Supreme Lord Himself is situated. If men simply see that deity, they are easily able to come back home, back to God, back to my Lord. In this way, Lord Jagannath is delivering the whole universe, especially as He rides on His cart before the eyes of all. Therefore, I offer my prostrated obeisances to Lord Jagannath, Subhadra, and Baladam on the occasion of their chariot ride and pray for them to forgive me for any offenses I've committed in my clumsy attempt to describe their glorious appearance." So that's the end of this particular article. Anybody have any questions about this or any comments? I have a question. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned there was a second deity of Nidhi Mahath in a place called B, starting with B. Yes. Is that still there? or? Yeah, well, nowadays they have many deities of Nila Madhava. In fact, even within the Jagannath temple itself, there's another deity of Nila Madhava there. I think there are maybe seven deities in the Puri temple. There's Jagannath, Baladam, Sipatra Devi, of course. They have a Sudarshan, a little stampa, the Sudarshan Chakra. And then they have Lakshmi and Saraswati and Nila Madhava, whom they call their Madan Mohan. So, but the original Nila Madhava that was in this story that deity is gone. 
So there are facsimiles, you can say. And that, there's quite a few of them throughout Odessa. They are, they're, they're regarded as the prototype of Lord Jagannath. <coughs> Anything else? Uh, are Bhakti Yatras <coughs> conducted during the same time across the world? Uh, is there, uh, is there a, why is, is it August, first Sunday of August? This is a hot topic. <coughs> Um, generally, it seems to me, at least, I don't really know because I'm not an executive, but it, it seems to me that Ratiatras are held at different times throughout the world according to the convenience of the locale and what will be perhaps most advantageous for preaching purposes. That has caused some disruption in orthodox circles, particularly in Puri amongst the Pandas, at the temple there, because they insist that it has to be performed only at this traditional date on which they perform it. So, yeah, they, they do hold Ratiatra at different times, but the actual original time is his mother. So Rohini was, she has a special qualification, because although she was a resident of, of Dwarka in her old age, in her youth she was living where? Vrindavan. Of course, she raised Krishna and Balaram herself, just like Yashoda did. Yashoda was her dear friend. So Rohini has a very special condition. She actually witnessed one of the very few residents of Dwarka who actually personally experienced those Rajali love. And because of that, one time, all the queens in Dwarka, they wanted to hear something about Krishna's Rajlila, his Balilas. And so they came and they were asking Rohini about this. And Rohini was saying, you know, this is a very confidential thing and we have to be very careful about who hears this and only some people even went in this World. That's how the Gaudiya Vaishnava charges explain it. Anything else? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, you said that <coughs> these deities, uh, Jagannath, Baldev, and Subhadra, they manifest in Treta Yuga, right? Even before Dvapar Yuga came, you said Puri was already there. No, no. That's when Nila Madhava was being worshipped by Vishwavasu at the end of Treta Yuga. <coughs> So, is it like in Dwapar Yuga, after all these leelas happened, the deities manifested to King Indra Jumna? No, because King Indra Jumna went to Brahma Loka. Okay. So, it's ages, ages, and ages, and ages. So, that he passed into the next Yuga? Uh, at least. Not only the next Yuga, I mean, you know, we have to understand. Depending on how long he was waiting there. If he was there for half an hour, that's already at least 30, 30 Divya Yugas. <laughs> right? So we don't really know the exact amount of time, but it certainly was not just the next yuga, because it's, at least according to this account, he had to wait for some time. The, why did Ratayatra come into being? Is there a story? Oh, this is a big deal. This is a very big story. How much time do we have? The question is, how did Ratayatra itself come into being? We've been discussing the appearance of Lord Jagannath, so this is like... You know, this will be a class of equal duration to the one that we just... <laughs> anyway, let me try to summarize. <clears throat> when Krishna, after Krishna left Vrindavan, he went to Mathura, he killed Kamsa. After killing Kamsa, then he, was, he went to Dwarka, he established his own headquarters at Dwarka. After some time at Dwarka, they decided that they were going to take a trip to Kurukshetra on the occasion of a solar eclipse. Even today... Lacks and lacks and lacks of people go to Kurukshetra for the solar eclipse. Famous place, it's been going on since time immemorial. So Krishna and the Yadavas, they all went to Kurukshetra and they did this. Now, at the same time, many of the Rajvasis also came there for the same purpose. And when Krishna was there with all of his royal people and Dwarka Nivasis and associates and un royal entourage, then the Vrajavasis saw him in that condition and the Vrijavasis, up until this point, you have to understand, they were just not even able to eat or sleep properly. They were pining away for his absence for many, many years after Krishna had left to Mathura, always sustained only by the hope that Krishna would return someday. So that the, the, the virahabhav, the, the separation that these Vrijavasis was feeling, is not something that we can really understand or explain. But it, it's profound, uh, to say the least. So when they saw Krishna there, it was a, it was a, it was a, a, uh, a very profound experience. 
So they, they wanted Krishna to come back to Braj with them. And particularly Srimati Radharani, she was not happy to see, see Krishna in this unusual condition. She was used to seeing Krishna with a flute tucked into his belt, with a gunjamala, with a turban on his head, peacock feather, barefoot, and covered with the dust of the cows, and carrying some rope, and a, and a packed lunch from home. To see Krishna dressed in royal silk and begarlanded and adorned with crown, golden crowns and surrounded by ministers and sages and, and uh, military elephants and horses and all these kinds of royal regalia, she just could not relate with this at all. And she was feeling this darshan is like a lance through the heart. She, she didn't like it. She wanted Krishna to be back in Vrindavan again, on the bank of the Yamuna, on the full moon at night, beneath Kadam tree, and enjoying in a solitary place, just uh, confidential pastimes of pure love, <clears throat> without any admixture of awe and reverence and aishwarya. So the Brijavasis, they wanted to pull Krishna back to Vrindavan, but Krishna actually had to go back to Dwarka. So Rathiyatra is this commemoration of this event, when Krishna is taking his chariot and going, he's got to make a decision, where is he going to go? Is he going to go to Dwarka? Is he going to go to Vrindavan? The answer as to where he actually went, it really depends on who you ask. <laughs> but uh, according to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his interpretation of the Rathiyatra, as it's celebrated in Puri, at least that was his vision. He would see it in this respect, that the Brijavasis are trying to pull Krishna back to Vrindavan, where he belongs. Because as far as the Brijavasis are concerned, Krishna doesn't really, he's not really at home anywhere else. And he, this was the kata that created these forms of Jagannath Bodham and Subhadra Devi to begin with. They were discussing the fact that Krishna, when he's in Dwarka, he's just not quite the same. He's not, not, cannot be happy. He's still thinking about Srimati Radharani. He's still thinking about Nanda and Yashoda, about all the cowherd boys, all the cows, all of his friends, all the places they used to play and the things they used to do. His mind is never peaceful just with this business of uh, settling who stole the Syamantaka jewel and what happened to Krura and killing Jarasantha and all these other kinds of things that he was doing at Varga. His heart, and at least according to what he mutters in his dreams at night, He's still thinking about the gopis in Vrindavan. So that was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's understanding of the Rathiyatra. <clears throat> and you can read in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's, it's elaborated there. The, the sentiments of Srimati Radharani that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was expressing, they're elaborated there. And that's, uh, according to Gaudiya Vaishnava charges, that's how we understand the significance of Rathiyatra. There's, as we say, there's an external reason, which is to commemorate this uh, lunar, this uh, eclipse at Kurukshetra, and then there's an internal reason, which is to somehow or other get Krishna to come back to Vrindavan. Is that okay? okay? Anything else? So, uh, based on these facts that we discussed, uh, we become most appropriate in this yuga to uh, worship Jagannath Baladeva and Subhadra are at home more than any of the deities in the mood of the sermon? I don't follow what your logic is. Um, because they, they are the form for the Kali Yuga. Krishna well, there are many deities for Kali Yuga. I mean, the most, the, and that's what Narada Muni says you know, when he requests Krishna to take this form in this Kali Yuga. Well, yes. uh, Specified, just like Vankatesh is another one. Bhagavad Gopal, the Narada Pancharatra says, he's the deity of the age. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're all of them. Really. But if there is a deity of the age, it's, I would say it's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And how do we worship him? By performing Sankirtana. So for us, we should at least keep the picture of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, along with Krishna, because they, they are worshipped together. And we should perform Harinam Sankirtana. Either at home or in public, it doesn't make any difference. Yajanti hi sumesasa. Anybody know the verse? <coughs> Krishna varnam tusha krishnam. Yajnaya sankirtanai praya. Yajanti hi sumesasa. Intelligent people in this age, they mainly perform sankirtanam by worshipping Shri Chaitanya.
one more thing sometimes sometimes the i've heard somewhere that the treta yuga and dwapara yuga they switch yeah and one last one when krishna appeared normally it comes dwapara first and treta but this it was switched around so during that time does the worship the sacrifice happens in dwapara yuga <laughs> i guess so i don't know the masking because you are telling the past times of jagannath and then indra dimna was eager so do we understand this all happened in this yuga yeah when krishna came yeah that's a good question i'm not sure because i've i've read other accounts that said that indra dimna was actually in such a yuga mm. and so who knows i mean it's, i'm sure this it's like you know some 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 sources say like the nada purana that we quoted it says that it was not vishnu himself who came as ananta maharana but Vish, um vishnu karma It, the language is vague. I think it said Devena Nirmitam. Mm. You know, Devena can be 